Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today are Georgetown University professors Jason Brennan and Peter Jaworski. They're the authors of Markets Without Limits, Moral Virtues and Commercial Interests. Welcome to Free Thoughts. I want to begin by asking a question. So we've got experts on this topic. It's something I have, my wife and I have argued about. I've asked it um, several times and always been told the answer is no. But can I sell my children? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Jay, why don't you feel this question? (laughs) That wasn't the first question I thought I was going to get. Here's our official view. Like you you can't have property rights in children per se. So you can't own a child the way that you can own, say, a cat or a guitar or um, a microphone. However, our view is something like this. There are a set of norms uh, that determine who is sort of eligible to adopt a child. Who is the – like who – and so pedophiles shouldn't get children, serial killers shouldn't get children, and perhaps some other people shouldn't get children as well. So those norms restrict how you can distribute children for free. Like you can't just – I shouldn't just give up my kids to a pedophile. Then our view is within – once you have those constraints in place, then it's fine to sort of sell off the right to adopt the child within those constraints. So, so anyone who can uh, adopt a child for free should be able to adopt a child for money. And in fact, if you look at the sort of empirical literature on this, um, there's reasons to think that if we had markets in adoption, um, that, that would actually lead to better outcomes for the children and for others as well. But there there would be markets in parental rights. They wouldn't be necessarily markets in people. Right. You wouldn't be owning – you're not actually selling the child per se. What you're selling is the right to adopt a child subject to the constraint that you're eligible to have a kid in the first place. So, So I can't buy you then. Well, the whole point of the book is that uh, I am for sale, and um, you know, I thought that was pretty clear. Like, <laughs> I can be sold, and I have a price, but uh, you know, it's a high price. That's all. You did sell the acknowledgments. No, these, what was it? You, you sold the yeah. We sold the acknowledgments to yeah. the book. Uh, we also sold the uh, what's the thing at the beginning? The dedication. The dedication. The dedication was bought by the Business Ethics Journal Review. Uh, Chris they, McDonald. Who do they dedicate? And Alexei to? Marcoux. To the readers of the Business Ethics uh, Journal Review. <laughs> oh, okay. That's yeah. right. Did, did your publisher have any problem with you doing that? No, he he liked it. He thought it was a fun publicity stunt. We even talked about having advertisements and marketing uh, or commodifying the book even further, but we decided the joke would go stale. They did at one point say, though, if you really are going to raise a huge amount of money on commodifying it and making all sorts of pictures and things, then you probably should share some of that money with us. But we didn't go that far. So we, we got to keep it all for ourselves, and we spent all the money on frivolous things. We didn't donate it to children or anything like that. That was, that was part of the deal. You're saying that like we should be respectful. <laughs> we didn't donate it to children or anything. We yeah. just spent it on frivolous things. On Metal. Yeah. We were supposed to spend it on like death metal. Yeah. Oh. Well, we made a promise that it wasn't going to go to charity or something. So it really was commodification okay. for frivolous reasons rather than uh, out of a sense of nobility. I mean, we also had categories. So we sold like we had a gold level uh, and then a platinum level. And then also Daniel Silverman, a, a philosophy professor, friend of both of ours, he put up a lot of money to make the highest level the silver mint tier. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is like the Kennedy Center wall, basically. Oh, that's what it was, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we did that with the book. It was fantastic. So why were some people on there multiple times? They paid multiple times. They thought it would be funny if they paid $5 to have their name mentioned five times. And we and they did. And, and, and we did it, yeah. And, uh, okay. You could get in with uh, just a dollar, oh. right? One dollar and your name goes... Goes in the book. Yeah, we raised over a thousand dollars doing that. It was pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. We, probably, we probably charged too little, actually. In retrospect, given how many people jumped on board, we should have charged a higher price. We should have, yeah. But there wasn't really a market in book acknowledgments at the time, so we didn't have a standard. We didn't have like a shadow market or something like that. We <laughs> right. had to create one on our own. It was. Was there any pushback or any negative responses to selling, not from your publisher, but just from other people? There was a philosophical critique that appeared on some blog or something, and they said, I'm not really sure if it it's metaphysically counts as a dedication if you sell it, because a dedication is sort of by necessity sincere, and so you can't really sell a dedication. And then people were debating sort of the metaphysics of dedications. And, uh, you know, fair enough. I mean, I don't really buy that view, but if you want to call it a schmedication or something, I think the... I I think the uh, people who purchased it were not particularly upset about that. You know, they yeah, there like, was a discussion on the Daily News philosophy blog about this, but most people thought it was it was all tongue in cheek. It was good fun. Nobody's confused that our acknowledgments are sincere acknowledgments. Uh, everybody understands that people just paid for those acknowledgments, so it was good fun. I just wonder because I'm, I guess I, my name appears as a paid acknowledgement in a lot of books because it's a standard thing on Kickstarter to you list everyone who backed the book and mm-hmm. so you know it says thank you to all of these people 
Yeah, a little bit so, different, but that, but that, but you were putting um, obviously your book to get to the the kind of heart of it. Um, there has been a lot of people who've written books in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, maybe, about how certain things shouldn't be bought and sold. And we opened up by talking about children or parental rights, but of course, organs and a bunch of things we can get to. But what was sort of the state of that debate as you saw it before when you guys started talking about what your book would contribute? Yeah, so every couple of years, um, someone comes out with a book on why you shouldn't be allowed to sell certain things. And fortunately, all those people agree that you are allowed to sell books about what shouldn't be for sale. And <laughs> a few of them, such as Benjamin Barber, despite more or less being a communist, and uh, Michael Sandel, have actually made quite a lot of money on these books. Um, but pretty much everyone says things like, you know, the market is okay, it's a useful tool, but the problem with the market is that it tends to spread like pigweed. And for immoral reasons, we have to try to constrain its scope. Uh, and so they come up with a list of objections or a number of different objections to why the market shouldn't be allowed to spread here and there. And we read that and we thought their arguments weren't very good, their evidence wasn't very good, and the arguments weren't satisfactory. So we thought, you know what this debate could use is like a big fat dose of truth. And we got paid to do it, which is even better. That's right, yeah. And actually, one of the bigger criticisms that we had uh, of most of those books is that they didn't make contact with the empirical literature. So one of the discoveries early on when Jay and I were working on the book is uh, Vivian Zelizer. She's a sociologist. She's chair of the uh, sociology department at Princeton, and she's written a number of books on the like more, uh, on the meaning of money, the the purchase of intimacy as a title of one of her books. And you had somebody in particular. I mean, both Jay and I were teaching Michael Sandel's uh, book, and also you know some chapters of his. And Michael Sandel talks about being able to buy and sell intimacy, being able to buy and sell friendship. He also talks about like what it means, what money means. Like what, what does it mean when I pay somebody to do something? It's this magical thing. It has this meaning. And he sits in his chair and he thinks about it. And I was talking to Jay about this. And after finding Vivian Zelizer, I was like, well, here's somebody who has done the research. Here's somebody who has looked at the meaning of money in different contexts and around the world. And she's come to radically different conclusions about what people in general think is the meaning of money. So why not include that in the book? And why don't we just make contact with the empirical literature in, in general? Because right? Michael Sandel sitting in his chair just kind of intuiting, like, oh, here's what this means. Well, that's, that's not good enough. Yeah. So what is the basic argument of the book? Because I'm sure people are thinking here, well, like, you can't buy love. Yeah. Like there there are just things that you you can't really buy. So are you, if you're saying oh you can everything is for sale or whatever no, but what is the basic argument? So the the basic thesis, um, not the argument per se, but the thesis is anything you can do for free, you can do for money. Um, there, like, and there's some way of being able to do it for money. So there are things you can't buy and sell, such as child pornography or slaves or um, you know assassination services or something, because you shouldn't be doing those things. Period. Um, if I gave you a gift of slaves, that would be wrong. But otherwise, if you can do it for free, then it is something that's eligible to be bought and sold. And then our basic structure to argue for that is two, twofold. One is to say, usually when people have a complaint about a market, they're not complaining about the commodification per se. They're complaining about a particular way it's being bought and sold. And so we can revise the way it's being bought and sold and that get, that'll change the problem. You know, So for example, Elizabeth Anderson at the University of Michigan complains about surrogacy markets and says that they're immoral. And she has a bunch of complaints about brokers and the nature of the contract. But you know, my friends, uh, Jason and Ben, recently recently purchased a surrogate to carry a baby for them, and they didn't have a, uh, a contract like that. They didn't have a, a broker. So it doesn't seem like she has a complaint about their particular market per se. And the other strategy is to just list and categorize every single objection that the others have come up with. We come up with a classification of them and then just systematically take them down. Well, I've read Sandel's book and it could use some rigor. That's part of the thing too. That it's what money can't buy, I believe. and and. It's not really a philosophy book, so you, breaking it down to a taxonomy of, okay, well, he's just sort of saying, I don't like that, but yeah. why is he saying I don't I don't like that? So, what are some of the things? I mean, that Sandel says that you shouldn't be able to buy. It's a pretty amazing list. I mean, I'm yeah. standing in line. Uh, yeah, he is standing in line, uh, uh, selling like the billboard at Yankee Stadium. He doesn't yeah, like that. The name of the stadium. The name of the stadium. He doesn't like that. So I guess autograph he like copies of your baseball cards. Uh, he doesn't tickets like tickets for free events at the park. 
The mixture of sacred sports. Yeah. Kidneys. <laughs> filthy. Get money filthy out of baseball. Yeah, sacred sports, of course. Yeah. Kidneys. We'll, ne- we'll never do that for money. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, some of the important things are kidneys, blood, uh, bone marrow, just standard things like that. You can't buy and sell uh, sex or you shouldn't be allowed to buy and sell sex, friendship, those things as well. There's a there's an enormous list. It would be it would be much better if Michael Sandel had offered like a categorization, a good categorization of the kinds of things that shouldn't be bought and sold. Uh, he doesn't offer it, uh, and so I think for most readers, like when you're reading his book, um, it's actually a pleasure to read. So I recommend that people go ahead and pick up his book and and read through it. But when you're reading it, he has these amazing anecdotes, right? This like, here's a story. And look, did you know that you can, did you know that you can buy a wedding speech at My this goodness, website? that's so horrible. I'm right. shocked. This is and, my shocked face, yes. And since most of the examples that he gives are, are things that the reader and most people are unfamiliar with, you get this kind of initial surprise. Like, oh, you can buy a wedding speech? Wait, that... That doesn't sound right. Probably you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And since people have those initial intuitions, they don't think through the case enough, Michael Sandel can give you a series of these anecdotes. And then by the end, you're like, you're right, Michael. Uh, The scope of the market is overly broad. It's taking over too much of the important things in life. And so maybe it should be restrained, right? Yeah. And here restrained means not necessarily illegal, but just it's morally wrong to participate in it. So many of the people that we're arguing against, they'll say things like, it's always morally wrong to buy sex, but nevertheless, prostitution should be legal the way it is in Germany. So to be clear, we're talking about the morality, not the legality. Okay. So that that gets at the question I was just going to ask, because there's a a number of ways to look at shouldn't. um, And I wanted to see how that played out in your... it's possible to say like you shouldn't be able to buy or you should this it's fine to buy this you shouldn't be able to buy it but we can make it illegal that's yeah. okay but um when you say it's permissible so you say anything that we could exchange for free we can it's permissible to exchange for money do you mean permissible in the sense that you shouldn't be prohibited it would be wrong to prohibit you or that there is there's nothing morally problematic about it like there are situations where adding money makes it like maybe not as good but it doesn't rise to the level of impermissibility. Yeah, we're saying it's not morally wrong to sell it. Yeah, so it's not about the law per se. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, for that respect, is in a sense not a libertarian book, despite what people might say about it. Because you could be, uh, you could be like a radical leftist and agree with everything you say. You should be like, yeah, all this stuff should be in the market, but it should be heavily regulated. That's compatible with our view. Um, Deborah Satz actually might think that, like that might be her position. She might actually be on our side. And then you could be like a hardcore sort of conservative libertarian, where you're like, you know, I'm no one should be forbidden from buying and selling this stuff, but I actually think markets are evil and people shouldn't engage in them. But nevertheless, they should be legal, even though people shouldn't do it. Now, no one holds that position, but you could. Yeah, a nice illustration of this point is um, I gave a talk at Brigham Young University on markets without limits, and everybody in that room was uh, a Mormon. And if you'll recall, our thesis is if it's permissible to have exchange, do or possess for free, then it's permissible to do all of those things. Uh, We say for money, but that's like a slogan version. Really, the the longer version is like it it would be permissible to have a market of some sort, of some description in that that item. So I was giving this talk at Brigham Young, uh, and the topic of prostitution came up. And I said, well, look, here's, here's the real question. Is it permissible for someone to have sex with a stranger for free? Is that permissible? And the people in the room were like, wait a second, no, 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 (laughs) you need to jump through these hoops in order to have sex with somebody. There are all these hoops. So it wouldn't be permissible to have sex with with a stranger for free. And so it follows that on their view, it wouldn't be permissible to have a market of any description. Uh, in that kind of uh, service, right? So that fits that fits within the thesis. That so if you have a morality with... that says casual sex, anonymous sex is wrong, then it makes sense that you would think it also can't be sold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think of our book as like part one of a, of a much longer series of books defending the market. Here's a bunch of people who think there are, there are these inherent limits to markets. So like markets make good things bad or they make bad things good. Jay and I are, are saying like, no, the market is neutral. 
right? Like there is no introduction of immorality or improvement. It's not like the market makes things better, right? The, the particular exchanges and the market doesn't make things worse. What makes it better or worse, like you might think, for example, that a market introduces incentives that weren't there already. But in the abstract, you can imagine, like suppose that somebody exchanged a particular item with the same incentives except remove the market here. If that's okay, then it's okay to have it on the market. And that that's kind of the central point. And then part two would be the more aggressive, like we want to defend prostitution, right? That would be part two or even maybe part three. Well, I want to get on that specific trading point. Mm. Why can things be – so is the trading a market or is it just – like so some people are okay with trading because you bought up trading a commodity. Is that what kind of market you're talking about? Yeah, so one of the problems or we have to deal with is like what counts as a market? Um, and we basically do like a critic's choice kind of issue here. We say when we're arguing against people, like there's reasonable disagreement on exactly what we're going to use the word market to refer to, what we're going to call an exchange, what we're going to call commodification. So we pretty much let the person we're arguing with at that to- at that moment or at that, pa- at that page determine, uh, define it their way, and then we show their argument doesn't work on their own terms. You know, so it really like we don't have to like stick to any particular definition of a market that might be contentious because we can kind of win either way. We do shift the ground like that, but we do also offer a definition of the market, which is the voluntary exchange of anything for valuable consideration. So uh, that that then is a bit different from the specifics of bringing money in because that definition of the market doesn't require any sort of money. And I'm, no. I'm curious about the role that money plays in – the thinking about these issues because there does seem to be like people get turned off specifically by bringing yeah. money into it. But but it seems like for a lot of these, like say the organ sales, there's – it seems like the, the problem is more like you know these people are – the reason that they're buying or selling this stuff is like bad reasons or reasons that we shouldn't endorse or they're, they're op- acting out of desperation. And so what we're actually rejecting is like exchanges for bad reasons. The money is just a way to kind of grease the wheels of those exchanges to make – to operationalize them, make them easier to engage in. But but it, is the money doing kind of extra work on top of that? Yeah. You know, a couple of points. One is on that on that particular objection that people have like, oh, the only reason you're willing to do this is because you're so desperate. So here's a, here's a kind of heavy-handed thing I believe. If you see people who are doing something out of desperation and all you do is stop them from doing it, you're a really, really evil person. <laughs> like, what the hell is wrong with you? It's like, by hypothesis, this person is horrifically desperate and they're doing that and it's their best option and you took it away. God, how awful are so you? So it's like someone's drowning you, in a pool yeah. and like they're reaching for something out of desperation yeah, and you, you stop are, them from doing if that. that's what yes. you do, you are the scum of the earth. But right? aren't you just stopping them from digging themselves deeper? Like that, that acting, you know, they're so desperate that this looks like a good option, but it's only going to make them worse off. So you're really helping them. Yeah. If you, if you actually knew that were the case, maybe you'd have an argument like, but most of the time they admit that, no, no, this is, this is their best option, but it's still wrong. So we shouldn't do it. But I think let's going back to the question of uh, like, the meaning of money and why, what is money because people do often focus on money per se, not just the exchange of other goods. And I think it's because there is a view about what money means. Um, so people say things like there's this Western perspective on money where money is impersonal. To put a price on something is to declare it to have purely instrumental value. It's to say that it's fungible with everything else of the same value. And so when you read the books on this, everyone says, no, no, when you put a price on this, you're saying that like adopting a child is just equivalent in value to 2,000 packs of spearmint gum, right? <laughs> I mean, and so therefore, by putting a price on something, you're degrading it because you're saying its value is instrumental and can be sort of exchanged perfectly with no loss with anything else with the same monetary value. And so that's why, um, you know, Peter brought up Vivian Zelazar, and it really turns out that this perspective on money, this way of imputing an impersonal, utilitarian, arm's length, of uh, fungible kind of attitude towards money, is a recent Western perspective. It is not the universal perspective of money. Money does not have to mean that. We could think of it as having a different kind of thing. And so, for example, Sandel really gets upset about the idea of giving uh, personal gifts or impersonal gifts versus personal gifts. Like a personal gift would be something like, I once had a a, a girlfriend of Polish descent and I she, I knew she really liked that and she saw this Polish Barbie and I saved it for Christmas and gave it to her like six months later and she was so pleased and look at how nice it is because I know about her preferences and so on. Whereas if I just given her $60 or whatever, like that would be impersonal. With a note that said here, there's a Polish Barbie. Go yeah, buy. or buy whatever else you want. Like, well, you isn't, know. isn't the sixth wedding anniversary a $100 bill or isn't that the, <laughs> is that the traditional yeah. like, tin paper wood, just cash? 
cash. Right. <laughs> but but around the world, you actually see people that like to give a cash gift is seen as just as thoughtful as or even more thoughtful than giving a non-cash gift. In fact, even in the United States in the 1800s, cash gifts were seen as especially thoughtful and non-cash gifts were not. So this is a contingent social construct. It's a way, it's a meaning that we have placed on the good. The meaning is not there. And then when we realize that the meaning is something we've placed on the good, we can start asking, is this practice, this practice of imputing meaning this way, a good practice or a bad practice? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's interesting. In my own case, I happen to be Polish since we're talking about <laughs> uh, about Poland. Um, my grandparents on both sides, on both my mom's side and my dad's side, they used to give my sister and I cash gifts when we would visit in Poland. And for us, it was, I mean, it was extra special because it was always U.S. dollars. So they would have to go to, so it's not the same as just like a, a gift of cash. But that's part of what made me think like, look, it was, it was deeply meaningful for them to have saved up $50 and then to give it to us. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Matt Bufton, he, he wrote down on a, on a dollar bill, he was like, Blue Jays, because that's something that I like. And so he wrote down something that I like on a gift for me, namely a, a U.S. dollar, and he handed it to me. And look, notice, it communicates something personal. It's like, I know about you, but we've skipped the, the bull, right? We, we've skipped all the nonsense where we've got to, like, purchase the gift that's thoughtful. Why don't I just write it down? on the dollar bill. And for me, I mean, I still have that dollar bill, so I haven't spent it. So I, I obviously think that's special. Even if this way that we think about money is a social construct, mm -hmm. it's not necessary, it's historically contingent, it wasn't always that way. So many of the objections to commodification are about it's commodifying this clashes with our values, it sends the wrong message, it um, it has different meaning and those themselves are all social constructs. So isn't to some extent it's like saying, you know, in a world where our values weren't what they aren't what they actually are, then money shouldn't have this thing, but that you know, human values or Western values or United States values are what they are. And so within this value system, money has these problems. Well, we're not pushing for relativism all the way down, right? I mean, we think like if you're going to have a debate about what's right and wrong, you're presupposing that there's some sort of truth of the matter that's not just mere opinion. But we are a relativist about or social constructivist about are things like the meaning that we attach to certain actions. So people will say things like the market in this good, even if it doesn't hurt anybody, even if it doesn't explain anybody, even if it doesn't violate anybody's rights or lead to a misallocation of resource or have any sort of other real moral problem is wrong because of what it expresses. And in that case, we can go, look, it looks like what it expresses is merely a, a social construct. And now we can ask whether it's a good one. So imagine, take the following case. Suppose we learn that if I, like right now, it's a social construct that when we say go to hell, that that expresses contempt. But if we were to discover that there's this weird law of physics that when you say go to hell, it causes like vibrations and air molecules, which when they hit your body, cause vibrations in the molecules in your body and then kills cancer, the morally right thing to do would be to revise the English language and make saying go to hell a way of expressing respect for people. So we can revise it. In that case, we should. Similarly, uh, the Four Ape tribe of Papua New Guinea had a social practice of eating the brains of their dead. They practiced endocannibalism. If you read the justifications for endocannibalism, it's really quite beautiful. It's that you're having part of the dead live on with you through every generation. Whenever I think about that, I tear up a little bit and I say, oh, I hope that my kids eat me, except, except that there's actually reasons not to do that. It turns out that that practice of imputing meaning in that way kills people. It spreads a certain type of disease and causes further death. And when the foray discovered this, they had the good moral sense to revise their practice in order to save lives, which is what really matters. So similarly, we, we look at this and go, there are a bunch of markets where like markets and kidneys and other things that we have imputed meaning to them in such a way that we do things or we forbid people from doing things that would save lives. Our practices of of imputing meaning are literally killing people. So the right thing to do is revise the practice to change the meaning we attach to things. And the refusal to do so shows like a lack of concern for real morality and overwhelming concern for surface social constructs. Well, we're talking about the, these kind of symbolic things, but you mis mentioned misallocation, which is one of the things that people get concerned. I think I, Sandel, if I remember correctly, I think Sandel is against scalping tickets or mm -hmm. secondary ticket markets. Mm -hmm. On, on allocation problems. So 
Bruce Springsteen is playing, and then you, you some rich person can just you know just buy a ticket. So someone stands in line and gets you know fr- seat one, front row, all the way. Rich person is like, oh, but I'll you know, I'll give you five thousand dollars for that, and or or goes to a scalper or whatever. And so now the rich people get all the good seats, and that and that's a misallocation problem. Is yeah. that is that a valid concern when it comes to markets and those things? Well, it's a weird. I mean, do you want to take this one or should I do it? Uh, I mean, the only thing that I would say to that is. You can set up the rules differently if you want to. If you want a certain distribution of people by socioeconomic categories to attend your concert, uh, you can do that. But it is okay for somebody like, I I don't know, George Soros to buy a ticket for $5,000 and get front row seats at a Britney Spears concert if that's what he wants to do. I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, so there are these particular goods that people think should be distributed fairly and equally. And so the example that Sindel gives is uh, there's a thing called Shakespeare in the Park in New York City. Mm. And uh, the, the people producing it would like for it to be free and open to everyone. Now, they completely and totally fail at doing that, even out of their own accord, because what ends up happening is people stand in line for a very long time to get the ticket. So rather than distributing it according to uh, the scarce resource of money, they distribute it according to the scarce resource of time. And now people start exchanging time for money. I'm rich and I can't can't aff- I can't afford giving my schedule to stand in line for three hours to get a ticket, but you can, and I can pay you to do it. So Sindel says, oh, it's just too bad that now rich people are getting to see this again. But by hypothesis, the poor people standing in line would rather have the money than to see the show. And also, there is a third party here. So even if there are people that weren't going to stand in line, like what you're having is a system in which rich people redistribute cash to poor people, right? So what's interesting also about Sindel is almost every single example he gives in the book like this about, oh, it's misallocated, there's ins- insufficient, and only rich people get it, they're all publicly provided goods, you know, Shakespeare in the park, doctors in Beijing and the free medical care there and a number of other like uh, express lanes on the high on the public highways and stuff. It's all like this is supposed to be a critique of the market, but it's it's always a case of a market like trying to fix a problem of scarcity introduced by underprovided government provision. Well, it seems like a lot of people would like those tickets to be distributed according to either Bruce Springsteen or Shakespeare in the park or whatever, how much they want to see it. Yeah. That, that would be a metric of doing that. So maybe standing in line conveys that more than money. Is, is that something we should be concerned? I mean, maybe we just can't can distribute things by how much people want it. Uh, but standing in line is saying a lot. Yeah, standing in line says a lot, um, but so does spending money say a lot. And uh, you know, for some people, like it's it's really hard to make these interpersonal comparisons without something like a market, actually. Because that, that, you, you know, need a, a willingness to pay, right? You yeah. need to express a willingness to pay, well, or a willingness like, to stand in line. In the communication, if I was like, "Hey, you know, Jay, I got um, I know, tool tickets, and I stood in line for two and a half weeks," or if I was like, "I got tool tickets, and I paid seven thousand dollars for them," it, the first one makes me seem like more of a diehard fan You're than the second one. Real yeah. yeah, exactly, and so. Tool. It's just like you deserve those tickets. I don't know. I, f- I feel like that's partly an illusion because, like, if I spend seven thousand dollars on on tickets, like that's you know a certain amount of work I had to do. So it's like I didn't stand in line, but the way that I got it was by, you know, doing my work. I guess I'm not a good example of that because no one thinks my work is particularly tedious or hard. But <laughs> but like you know, if I imagine I'm like a, a waiter at Denny's or something, and I'm like I, I instead of standing in line, what I do is I serve people sandwiches for three months. Like, that's how I earn the tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Or for, I mean, but the worry people have here is like, well, there's some people that can earn that money really, really quickly. $150 tickets, that's an hour's worth of work. Whereas for other people, that's like 15 hours of work. And similarly, like standing in line, if you get there first come, first serve, if you if you manage to get there first thing in the morning, then you might not have to stand in line that long, but uh, others might have to stand longer. So we don't really have a good mechanism that really tracks people's desire for things. Neither one of these is particularly good. Does this just mean that we should... We should change the mechanism based on – so you said that these are publicly provided goods and that the, all of Sandell's examples. But the other thing is they seem to be finite goods. Like they're really – there's there's only so much supply of Shakespeare in the tar- Park tickets that are possible. There's only so much supply of express lanes. Like you can only pack so many cars into it. And so if 
if it's something that we can't, that the extra money that people would be spending would just increase the supply of goods, that's one thing. But if there's a finite, then maybe the money does create yeah. problems. I, I don't think distribution according to need is what people need, to quote David Schmitz. I don't think distribution according to desire is what people desire. So imagine like you're coming to a four-way stop. Like we have rules for four-way stop signs. Like whoever gets there first gets to go. Simultaneous arrival, then the person on the right gets to go, et cetera. I forget what happens when literally all four people arrive at once. I think you just point each other through. Uh, but we also have a rule that says, like, if you're in dire emergency, you get to go first. Like, if your lights are flashing, we're supposed to sort of stop and let you go. And if you have a siren, we let you go. So why don't we just distribute according to need all the time? Well, imagine how awful that would be. Imagine every time you got to a four-way stop sign, if there's another car there, you had to, like, get out and talk to each other and figure out who the neediest person is. Or instead, the most desirous person, the person who really wants to go first because they really have somewhere they need to get to go. That system would suck. It would be terrible. It would be incredibly inefficient. And everyone, people wouldn't get their needs met and their desires met. And I think something similar goes with a lot of these other kinds of allocation mechanisms. Like we might very well think that ideally we have goods distributing according to like whoever's going to get the most utility out of them. Um, and we don't have a perfect way of doing that. But empirically speaking, markets are much better at tracking that than queuing, which is super duper inefficient. Does keeping things off limits to markets um, perhaps help as a buffer zone? So if you, you – if your thesis is that anything that it is permissible to have or sell for free or have or exchange for free, um, markets ought to be. But maybe maybe the, one of the things that happens is as we commodify things, the more things we commodify, the more willing we are to then commodify things or exchange things that should have been off the table all along. You know, see, so it's like a, it's a slippery slope to dystopia. Um, and so by just roping off a whole bunch of things, we're kind of providing a buffer. Yeah, I think that's a, a common criticism that people make. Uh, the criticism says something like, here we are on a slippery slope. If we allow all of these different things on the market, then eventually more and more things will be on the market. But I'd like to know exactly what we need the buffer for. Because what really matters in a lot of these cases are the actual attitudes that people have towards these objects. So take the, the following example. I think people have an obligation to care for their pets. I think people have an obligation to not harm their pets. I mean, in fact, Jay and I might disagree, but I have a, a different view about whether or not pets, at least certain kinds of pets, count as property in the first place. But people should have certain attitudes. Now the question is, like, what does money and markets do to the attitudes that people have towards their dogs or their cats? And I think the answer to that question is exactly nothing. Like, people buy their dogs. And then they love them like members of the family. So what is this buffer that people want? I mean, there's also different ways to sell things. So for example, we want people to look at works of art in a particular way, right? We want them to appreciate the Renoirs, the whatevers, right? We want them to have that attitude. And yet those things are sold on a market, except they're sold on an auction market. And auctions are special because what they do is they mark out the items up for auction as unique and distinct. You can't participate in the auction unless you read a booklet about the items that are up for auction in the first place. So if you want people to look at objects as being unique and special, non-fungible, non-instrumental, one option for you is an auction market. Right? So sell it via an auction rather than just at a Walmart. So maybe we do want a buffer zone, I guess, but there's just these different kinds of markets that you could use to preserve the well, attitudes. Maybe, uh, maybe that's just an example of why people don't like pet store dogs, but they go to a breeder. So, it, so it's, a, it's still a market, so, yeah. but you know, pet stores seem like Walmart and a breeder seems like more individualized. Actually, on that very point, I, I read an article that said recently that there's such a high status now for having so-called rescue dogs. Um, they used to just be called dogs from the pound, but now we call them rescue dogs because why not engage in some moral grandstanding while we're at it? Uh, that breeders are now selling the <laughs> – like there's breeders selling the dogs to pounds in order to have them get rescued because they can't get a market otherwise. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so that's almost – that's, that's shocking and yeah. very sad. But, but kind of – Kind of more broadly, one thing we found was that like most of the people in this literature make an empirical claim, which is that participating in certain markets or commodifying certain things has a negative effect on our character. Um, 
And for some reason, they don't seem to have access to the same journals that we do because they didn't go and read them. They mostly cite one sort of ambiguous study that took place in Haifa, Israel in the 1970s. And then they're like, aha, therefore markets like corrupt our character. And in fact, like one of the things we do in like part three of the book is just say, well, it looks like Peter and I actually have access to more empirical stuff than everyone else. So we went and read it. And uh, it's surprisingly on in favor of markets. It's like, well, it turns out participating in markets doesn't make you more selfish. It actually makes you nicer. It what is you... that that study? The, oh, the, the, the story is interesting. Yeah. So in some experiment done in Haifa, Israel in the 1970s, uh, they found that there were a lot of parents who were picking up their children late from daycare. Mm -hmm. So then some economists said, why don't we try introducing a financial penalty um, for, for picking up your kids late? And we'll start it off very, very low, and then we'll raise it. So a written, like, so say, let, I forget the exact numbers, but let's say like 20 percent of people are picking up their kids late every day. Um, then they introduce a very small financial penalty. It was like the equivalent of like five bucks uh, in current dollars. So then uh, what happened was the number shot up. It went higher rather than lower. And then they kept raising like the number of people who picked up their kids late. And then when they raised the price even higher, then fewer and fewer people picked up their kids late. So one reading of this, which is consistent with of the evidence is that what happened was I felt bad that I was picking up my kids late. Like I felt like you and I had a sort of more than more than transactional relationship, and I was putting you out. But when you put a price on it, I switch over from thinking in a moral way just to a purely transactional way, and I'm just willing to pay the price. Okay, fair enough. Here's another interpretation: the fact that the price was so low communicated I was wrong about how much I was putting you out. Money. So the problem, the weird thing about this is that the people who make these arguments are all talking about the meaning of money, and they miss that money means something and prices mean something. So, for example, if I suppose like uh, I just get mad at my wife for continuing to leave dishes out, and I'm like, "Damn it, Lauren! Henceforth, like if you leave a dish out, you're gonna have to pay me for the cost of burying your your mess." And and I'm like, "And you're gonna have to pay me a nickel." <laughs> she. What would happen was she'd go, "Oh." I thought I was really putting you out by like by leaving the dishes out, but if it, all it takes to compensate you is a nickel, I was wrong. I guess it really wasn't that high of a cost. You're only a nickel mad. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So it, like it's like the problem with that particular study is that it's it's consistent with both of those particular readings. It doesn't decide between them. So when you go and look at the other literature, it seems to suggest that no, actually markets tend to make us nicer and friendlier and more trusting and more caring. They don't make us more selfish. In small group settings, sometimes introducing money can lead to a degree of impersonal and like a degree of mistrust, but in large group settings, introducing money actually greatly increases trust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if anything, the literature goes the other way. Um, in fact, for what it's worth, uh, there is an exchange between Michael Sindel and um, Herbert Gintis on this very point in the Boston Review, and Gintis just called Sindel on this. He's like, Sindel, you're just wrong about the empirical lit, and why are you keep saying why do you keep saying the same thing? And then Sindel kind of like waved his hand at it, and then two weeks later gave a talk at Brown where he completely ignored Gintis all the stuff that Gintis brought up and just said the same thing to his audience. So maybe he read the stuff and wasn't convinced, or maybe he just knew the people at Brown wouldn't know better. I don't know. I'm curious if the people who Use that study to say, look, um, introducing these these small penalties um, just commodifies things. Would then also argue against government fines for violations of laws and regulations. Well, at least if they did, they would be consistent. But you're right; we don't see that. And actually, now that Jay brought up Herbert Gintis, it's worth pointing out the other side of this particular discussion. So Gintis and his colleagues went to like small scale societies. Uh, in remote parts of Africa, and they played different kinds of economic games like uh, the ultimatum game, the dictator game, and so on. And what they found is that in some of these um, small-scale societies, people would behave more fairly, and they would care more about the other side of the transaction, like who is harmed and who is not harmed. They would divide the dollar more close to equal. And Gintis and his colleagues regressed on a number of different possible differences. So how religious were these groups, uh, whether they were, um, you know, the gender disparity in the groups, all these different things. And what they found is that the one thing that explained uh, the groups that were more fair in their distribution of the dollars, uh, are, uh, it had to do with how frequently they made contact with markets, how integrated they were with markets. The more interaction that people had with markets, the fairer and the more concerned with what was going on inside of other people's heads these people were. That was the one discovery that they had. You know, in the 19th century, there was a popular thesis called the du commerce thesis. My, 
my French teacher is going to kill me. It's, it's the gentle <laughs> commerce thesis. Uh, it used to be very popular, and it said that like markets make us better people. You know, right now, Michael Sandel, um, maybe Elizabeth Anderson and others worry that markets make us worse. They change our character from good people to bad people. And Jay gave a nice explanation for why they think that. But it turns out in the 19th century, they used to believe that like markets would make us better people. Well, this is obviously an empirical question. And now Jay and I cite Herbert Gintis on our side. We say, look, Gintis and his colleagues have discovered that markets make people better people. Right? And, and it should be small wonder. You know, like I go to the store and I buy something and I say thank you for the thing that I've bought and the other person says thank you. Isn't that like in a way magical? And how do I make money on the market? Isn't it about like figuring out what you people want? Right? And isn't it about catering to what you people want? And so now I get into the habit of thinking about what other people want, what would make other people happy. And if I get into that habit, then I become a better person. I start caring about other people more. So that's our story here. And, and the empirical literature, I think, is on our side, but that's an ongoing debate. Yeah, it's not just Gintis. It's a bunch of other studies, and we cite, try to cite basically all of it. And part of the, the Dieu commerce thesis, I, I didn't take French. I took That was even worse than yeah, me. Okay, uh, thanks for that. How is this spelled, by the way? Je suis désolé, je n'ai parlé pas le français. That's all I know. So... Like, um, Pourquoi les enfants? Yeah. yeah he's, he's Canadian, but this doesn't count. <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's not real French anyways. Um, so, anyways, like, like part of the part of the e-commerce thesis is that uh, I'll become more tolerant because I have a market. And, in fact, empirically speaking, that is correct. There's a, there a paper in APSR a couple years ago just on this very point. Like, it turns out the markets make us more tolerant of difference. And the idea is something like, you know, I'm Christian and you're Muslim and you're an infidel and you think I'm an infidel and I hate you and you hate me, but, man, you really kind of want my wool and I really kind of want your spices. So we're willing to overcome our aversion to one another in order to make the exchange. And then upon interacting with each other, we discover, hey, you're really not so bad. You're really kind of like me. So despite, like, you know, if you go to, like, Marxists uh, in, like, the universe, I mean, they're not empirical anyways. They just ignore evidence and not invade it in order to make up stuff. But, uh, like, they'll say things like, markets are responsible for racism and sexism and all this other stuff. And it's like, nope, empirically, actually, they're not. Empirically, they actually tend to undermine it. In fact, the reason you're talking about this here and not about people in other societies is because it's in these market societies where people start thinking this is a problem. On the Gintis findings, I'm curious because it I could see them, at least as you described it, not supporting the conclusion that you just drew about markets uh, making people more fair because is it do we know if these people – so the people who were – who didn't have as much of an integration with markets um, and so therefore in these games were behaving less fairly, um, were they in fact less fair in other non-market sorts of games? Like were they uniformly less fair or were they simply less fair when they were engaging in market activity? Because you could also interpret it as um, that – you know, basic human decency and fairness are powerful drives, um, but markets, as it, when markets are novel, they kind of screw with all. Like we're not really sure how to react in them, so you're bad at it the first couple of times. But once you get practice, then your basic human decency reasserts itself. Well, I think I think here's some evidence. People have done these kinds of studies other ways. It's not just Gintis and Henrik and others. And so you can go. They've gone around the world, kind of playing games with people, and it, and you find like a nice cor like correlation. Like the more market oriented your society, it's measured by like the Fraser Index. The more market oriented your society, the nicer you play these games. The less market oriented, the worse. So it's not just like complete non market participants don't play very well. It's actually like people in in sort of somewhat marketized com com countries who do participate in markets but not as much also play less well. Um, but there are also things like um, the amount of money people give for charity per capita is positively correlated with how market-oriented your society is, even when you control for income. So it's not just because you're richer. Um, things like your degree of tolerance for difference, your degree of liberalism is higher based upon how market-oriented your society is, even when you control for other kinds of factors. And so you find um, lots of kind of positive character traits are correlated positively with the market orientation of your society and negatively correlated with being in a non-market society. And we should say it's the Fraser Institute and Cato Institute, Economic Freedom of the yes. World Index. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we talk about things like 
like kidney markets, which which make a lot of people uncomfortable. And we're talking about a lot about symbolism, what these things symbolize, what people think about money, what it does to your thought process. But a lot of people would say, this isn't necessarily my concern. My concern is waking up in the bathtub with ice with your, you know, the scar. My concern is poor people selling their kidneys for money. My concern is like, we're now distributing based on money. So like the Bruce Springsteen concert, which maybe was like a funny joke, but now we're actually saying that like rich people are going to live and poor people are going to die when it comes to who's going to get kidneys. Yeah. Like these are real exploitation, distribution, like, like treating human beings as a market commodity and meat problems that have nothing to do with what I think of money. It's just what will actually happen. I think that you've raised what to me was the biggest motivation for writing the book in the first place. The questions that I'm most concerned about are things like uh, a market in kidneys, a market in bone marrow, a market in human blood. These things have real life and death kind of significance. So we should split the like how do we uh, acquire the kidneys from how do we distribute them, right? First, the bathtub, the people in a bathtub kind of question. Look, the worst kind of market we can have is a black market. And the kinds of things that you're worried about are descriptions of the black market and not really the like above ground market. If you think that like if we legalize the sale of kidneys in the United States, do you think suddenly hospitals would just buy a kidney from someone who has a kidney in a cooler? You think somebody with a kidney in <laughs> a cooler can go to the local hospital and be like, hey, guys, go ahead and risk your license. Go ahead and risk everything and just buy this kidney from a cooler. No, of course that's not going to happen. I picture like just guys like one kidney, one kidney right here. It's like, <laughs> like, the, like an old like snake oil salesman, yeah. you know, get with a cane. Kidney, it's like, yeah. get your kidney right here. I got a kidney for yeah. I don't know. fell off a truck somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So I see that people are worried about, you know, waking up in a bathtub with a kidney missing. But that's not a description of like the market as it would exist here in the United Isn't States. Isn't that more a problem in a market as – or in a lack of market as it exists now? If you, a, I mean if you can buy one, then you can buy one. But if you can't, well, then maybe you'll try stabbing the guy. You can incentivize somebody to give you that kidney so you don't need to steal it, right? You can do it. OK. Now, I said split the like acquisition of the kidney from the distribution of the kidney. Because notice that we have a market in food. And what do we do with people who are poor? We give them food stamps, right? The fact that like people are subsidized to purchase an item like food doesn't mean that we don't know that we no longer have a market in food. We do. We could have something like kidney stamps. So if you're poor, we could keep the distribution constant. Namely, we could continue to distribute on the basis of need or something like that, but have a market in the acquisition of kidneys. And we would save, like, look, the, the following is uncontroversial. We could save thousands of lives every single year if we had a market in kidneys. So the arguments against having a market in kidneys better be worth thousands of lives per year. I don't know why people don't realize this. They're like, here's, here's an argument. If we introduce money into the, into the kidney exchange, why, that'll treat people like objects or something like that. I'm like, OK, that's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good argument. Are you willing to pay, say, 1,500 lives per year to avoid this outcome? The answer almost uniformly is no. So if you compare the two sides of this particular exchange, you know, it it better that we save 1,500 lives and that, you know, say 1,500 people are regarded as objects, say, yeah. than that we let those 1,500 people die. Also, empirically, Peter, who right now gets the kidneys in the lottery? Is it actually distributed equally according to socioeconomic status? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> only sure only, actually, amazing. there have been studies on this. Only rich people get the kidneys. So in a sense, yeah. the whole poor people won't get them isn't actually an objection because they don't already don't get them. Um, so yeah. since they don't get them, there's not a worry about taking them away. How we are they can being only distributed if the rich people are getting them now? Well, part of the reason for that is that uh, richer people tend to be better candidates, like they're healthier, so they're better candidates for receiving the kidney. Part of it might be that there's who know no one really knows why this is. Maybe there's some double dealing on the background, like some furtive markets that are going on. Well, maybe it's I people mean, using their connections it's and a things big incentive like that. To slide. Twenty thousand dollars into the table to whoever makes yeah. a decision. If it's life or death for you, and yeah. you have twenty thousand dollars. I mean, and the issue here is pretty big. There's o there's now over a hundred thousand people just in the United States alone who are waiting for a kidney. And the overall majority will not get one. And that that's true. And the numbers are increasing. But the reason why the numbers are increasing is actually, in a way, good news. It's because our dialysis technology has become better. Although people who are on kidney dialysis, it's basically, it's basically really close to torture. 
you have to go there like three times a week. You sit there for two hours, and then a machine filters your blood for you. And that's a significant cost, too. So here's a way to save the medical system a lot of money. Pay for the kidneys, right? The cost of dialysis swamps the cost of a kidney transplant operation, even if people are paid for kidneys, right? The U.S. government spends an enormous amount of money on dialysis um, in the U.S. every single year. So it would save the government money. It would just be better all around. Do we have any idea what the price of a kidney is? Uh, we know the estimates of what the price of a kidney in the U.S. Uh, might have to be in order to clear the market, right? So it would be somewhere around eighty to 100000 And by the way, people say things like, oh, well, the poor are all going to sell their kidneys right away, and so they're going to get a really low price. And first of all, there's a couple of problems with this. One is, like, the thing that determines the price is not so much desperation, it's the amount of competition. Uh, if, if you read Ricardo, competition dominates desperation when it comes to bargaining power. But here's another thing you could say. I'm, I don't think that the poor are, like, this is what Michael Sindel thinks. The poor are so desperate that none of their um, transactions count as consensual. I guess that means you can't sell them a sandwich either, because by hypothesis, that's not consensual. But if you really believe that, then here's a way of legalizing kidney markets um, and thinking that they're morally permissible. Everyone can sell a kidney provided they make $30,000 a year. Now, in that world where we had that law, there would be some poor people selling them on the black market for a low price still. But nevertheless, the predominantly markets would be coming from upper class people or people who are doing pretty well. And there are a lot of people that still be willing to sell their kidney for like $80,000 under that kind of system. So you can constrain the market in a way that will alleviate the objection. And this is often the problem that people have. It's like they're complaining about the market per se on the basis of contingent features of the market that we can eliminate. You know, like, so if you're like, I don't think that you should buy chicken nuggets from uh, Chick-fil-A because they hate gay people. It's like you're not objecting to chicken nuggets per se. You're object objecting to chicken nuggets from that particular vendor. You guys cover a lot of the anti-commodification arguments in the book. And I'm curious, which one or maybe ones you've heard since you wrote the book do you think are is, – is the most – they're interesting, I guess because these are two different things, interesting and or the, the strongest. I'll go with interesting. Peter can take strongest. So my uh, my brother in law is a surgeon, and my sister in law is um, a medical dietitian, and they were talking about this stuff, and they're like, "But, but you don't understand. You see, a lot of the people they see the people who come in and need organs, and they're like, a lot of these people they're just kind of like human train wrecks, and the reason they're so sick is because they take bad care of themselves, and we shouldn't allow those people to get a kidney. They should just die." And they're like, "What do you think of that?" And I said, uh, "You know, to be honest, I hadn't considered like responding to just pure misanthropy in the book." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the most interesting objection I've gotten. Uh -oh. In terms of the strongest, I think an objection from uh, the philosopher Mark Wells is I, – I still think it's the best and I think Jay and I might be on different sides of this issue. But here's our thesis. If it's permissible for free, it's permissible for money. Mark is uh, – Mark's response is like, OK, well, take the category of things that are obligations. Like here's things that I'm obligated to do. So in a sense, I owe it to you already. Well. If you're obligated to do something, then you're permitted to do that thing, right? Um, so it follows that you can do it for free, but you can't then make it contingent on money. So here's a concrete example. Suppose you're walking along and there's like a baby drowning in a puddle. And so you're obligated to pull the baby out of the water. Let's suppose that you and I agree about the ethics of this particular issue. Never mind the people who think that we're not obligated to save drowning babies or something. Uh, we'll just ignore that. Whole <laughs> that's so, that's uh, a pretty way, fringe group. Let me, yeah. let me yeah. just say to that fringe group, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, the despite end. what Murray Rothbard said. Despite, yeah. oh, Especially God. despite what Rothbard said, yes. Uh, right. So, so I'm obligated to pull the baby uh, out of the water. And in fact, I have to do it. Like, if I were to stand there and say, well, I'll pull this baby out of the puddle for $5, right? No, I can't do that. So I have to pull the baby out. I owe it to that baby to, to save it, right? And so I can't, I can't have a market in those things. Now, go ahead, Jay, because yeah. Jay has a good response but to then this objection. I think it's true that you can't threaten not to do it in exchange for money like because you're not allowed to threaten not to do this, but you can still get money for it. I mean, like let's say you think that you have an obligation to uh, fight like during a draft. I don't think that, but suppose you think that. Or I could imagine a case where I would think that. Nevertheless, we still pay those people. Um, if somebody saves the baby and then we are like, we're going to give you a cash reward, like $10,000 for saving the baby, he's not obligated to say, no, I can't take that because then it would be introducing a market. So so again, it's, you can actually receive money for doing things that you're obligated to do. You can receive rewards for it. I mean, like 
you know, within a marriage, you might like reward each other for taking good care of the children, even though like you owe it to the children to take good care of them for free. So we do have reward systems for people doing their duty. Um, you just can't threaten not to do your obligation. Well, that would seem to be that would just add the extra badness in. So it, it, it would you just see a baby and then you act the threat is yeah. the bad is the wrongness. But getting rewarded after the fact, it's not exactly the same as getting paid to do something. No, and and it, it's you know it's essential to something's being a market that it's a quid pro quo. Like I will do something, uh, you know, just in case you, you know, I will quid if you quo, right? So I make it contingent in that way. Another example that Jay came up with in response to this objection is the case of the lifeguard. Like we pay lifeguards to sit on alert. And then when people are drowning, they're obligated, you know, just like all of us, I guess, would be obligated to save the drowning person. But we do pay a person to kind of sit there on alert. Is that really a, a counter to it? Because we're not paying them in the moment. We're paying them to make their time available, just like we could pay people to wander around looking for babies who are drowning. But then if that person said, OK, now that the baby's drowning in front of me, give me $5, the lifeguard said, OK, OK, I'll save this person, but you give me $5, that seems different and troubling. Well, I mean, in a sense, yeah, because he's already agreed to, to save the baby now that he's there. But I mean, suppose like we stopped paying him, he just didn't show up that day because he's like, you guys haven't been paying me. I've worked here for six weeks. I haven't gotten a paycheck, so I'm not coming to the pool that day. And a kid drowns. You know, I mean, think that was... but if he was there, if he was already there, and then and the kid was drowning, and he said, "Well, you haven't paid me in a week, so I'm not going to hop in." He goes on strike. We'd, <laughs> yeah. So, I think... but I mean, I think this illustrates like uh, it'd be weird. Like, what I'm worried about this is that it's going to come down to like, oh, whether we're going to call it a market or not. We're like, there, but we still have an ex example of a person who is doing something and getting money for it, and in some cases, they're only willing to be there to do it in the first place because of the incentive of money. Yeah, Jay's, Jay's response goes something like this. Jay, interrupt if I'm wrong about this. It's something like, look, take a look at the nature of the thing that we're talking about, namely uh, saving children from drowning. Is there a way to have a market in that particular good? The answer is yes. And of course that's right. We do have lifeguards and nobody thinks there's anything the matter with paying somebody. Uh, my own gut tells me that I'm sort of – your last point, Aaron, is exactly how I feel about it too. It's like, I, no, I'm not talking about the, the nature of the good, right? I'm talking about this like moment to moment, like right now I have this obligation and I have to do it and I can't make it contingent on anyone paying me. But, but that I think brings us to like one class of objections we consider early in the book because like the first part of the book is to really clarify what the debate is about. And actually in doing so, we knock out about half of the things can people complain about. Um, so we say there are what we call contingent objections to markets. Um, they're, they're on about incidental features or incidental features of, of markets. So um, you could point to particular examples where it would be wrong to sell something even though normally it's okay. So for example, if I say, um, you know, Peter, you gave me um, a lunchbox and I promise never to sell it. Well, then I, I can't sell that thing even though by given my promise, I could still give it away for free. And so like, ah, oh, there's a thing you can do for free you can't have for money. It's like, yeah, that very specific thing given that very specific promise I can't do. But it's not very interesting because it's still in general you can sell lunch boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are going to be all these kind of cases like this where it's like, no, right now in this particular case, like you've got to do it for free. You, you can't do it for money. But nevertheless, that is the kind of thing that can be bought and sold. So if we make it about sort of interesting natural kind, it's like, yep, yeah, that kind of thing can almost always be bought and sold if it's the kind of thing you can do for free. Well, that, that's uh, so. Oh. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, two things. First, I did give Jay a lunchbox. In fact, it's like human live kidney inside is a funny lunchbox. <laughs> no kidney, though, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Second, uh, this might call for what might seem like a, a tiny little change in our thesis, but we say, you know, if it is permissible but not obligatory to do for free, then it's permissible but not obligatory to do for money, right? So if we change, if we make that tiny change, then that covers all of those cases. Now, for philosophers like us, that's a really big deal. Like I still think that objection is a beautiful objection to a book of philosophy, right? It's significant and we would have to adjust like our thesis in light of it. Um, so it's a big deal, but it would be a way to deal with it if Jay's response about natural kinds uh, isn't, isn't good enough. Let me give you another example like this, like the Mark Wells example. So this was brought up to me by uh, Lauren Lamaski, who's a boisterous professor at UVA. Uh, and, um, he said, well, look, I'm obligated to give my students a grade. Um, so so can I just now say to them something like, I'm going to auction off grades in my class and give you an A because you paid me, not because you actually earned it. And I said, no, in light of like previous existing 
agreements that you've made and in like representations you've made, like you've now acquired an obligation to distribute grades according to merit, not according to like how much students pay. But nevertheless, grades are the kind of thing that can be bought and sold. Like if I want to start a new university, let's call it like, you know, University of Phoenix or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> like I want to start a new university and in there I'm, I make it clear up front, like you're going to have classes, but at the end of the day, like the grade that you get is dependent upon how much money you pay for the class. And we're not going to lie to people when we tell employers like what grades mean on transcripts. We'll say, oh, by the way, we auction off grades. Like, and I, I make that all clear. I don't lie about it. And I start the university and to my surprise, a bunch of people enroll in it and they start buying their grades and then employers for some reason hire them even though like I haven't lied. I'm like, look, it's weird, but I think that's perfectly permissible. So it's like I can always find a way to sell that thing in a permissible way, even if I can point to specific instances where it'd be wrong to do so. Is there anything that is permissible to sell now or we think of as permissible that you think should not be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I had, there's probably a number of cases where I say, oh, we shouldn't sell that thing in that particular way. The new Garth Brooks album. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should not I, be for sale. My only objection to some things out on the market, I'd have to, I'd have to sit and think, but, but my gut tells me that probably there's a bunch of things where I say, don't sell it that way, sell it differently. Like arms deals that you might, like let's sell a bunch of weapons to this particular dictatorship. Oh yeah, nu yeah. like nuclear weapons just simply should not be for sale. Period. Right. Yeah. And when because when you the shouldn't US, have them. Yeah. yeah when the U.S. and That's other a pretty countries, strong claim. When yeah. when the U.S. and other countries make sales of certain arms, I think probably they shouldn't. Can you give do one that. away for free? No. No. I mean, okay, so yeah. I think we have before given a nuclear weapon, like maybe, hey, here's a free nuclear weapon, Israel. I, I, mean, I have no idea. Maybe we could sell. I think nuclear disarmament is a good idea all around the world. But that, so that brings up a question about, about practicality because you you raise a little bit, it was like, I think the really clear and excellent part of the book, which is very good, um, is you say, you, cl you sort of clean out the cobwebs and say, your objections to this thing being bought and sold, most of them have actually not about the thing. They're about other effects that are come with the thing. So we will just say we can regulate that market in a different way and fix that problem. So if your problem is, as you said, the kidneys, you can't sell a kidney under $30,000, all this stuff. But is that a realistic thing to expect from government? Maybe one reason we don't actually have that market in some of these things is because, you know, I mean, I'm a libertarian. I don't really expect government to do a good job of fixing all these little problems that we may have with the distribution and, you know, with whether it has effects for the poor and whether they're being exploited. And so we just don't have a market in that. And so realistically, we just prohibit a market because we can't fix it. Yeah, there's, there's two senses in which um, – a system could be unrealistic. I was just writing about this because we, Boss Van der Voss and I have been writing about open borders and people say, well, that's not realistic because people don't support it, right? So there's two senses of realism. One is the policy isn't going to happen because people don't like it. Um, and the reason they don't like it is because they don't understand it. And that might be, that's the case for a lot of policies. They don't understand the market, so they're not going to vote for it. They're not going to support it and the politicians will cater to it. Um, and that's a problem, but the way you fix that is hopefully by informing people, though if you read my other recent book, I don't think that's going to work either. <laughs> um, but then there's another sense of irrealism where it's like the reason this isn't going to work is because all of the incentives are wrong. Like if you had the policy in place, then the incentives would cause people to create conflict. So that's why like communism is unrealistic because the incentives are all wrong. And the things that we're advocating don't have that problem. They have the problem of lack of support, but they don't have the problem of creating bad incentives that undermine the very institutions. So. Um, if we could wave a magic wand and legalize or kidney sales and legalize prostitution and legalize a bunch of other things we think should be legalized and then like and then we forbid people from changing those laws, those markets would operate just fine. They don't have any kind of internal dynamic that it's problematic or inherently uh, problematic. And, and in addition, Trevor, I mean that magic wand, it's like the courts. So let's take a concrete case, the case of human bone marrow, right? The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals for the, what is it, Ninth Circuit? The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The, okay, that, that order. In 2012, uh, a case was brought before them by the Institute for Justice, and they ruled that it is permissible, it's legal, for people to be compensated for giving a bone marrow donation, provided that they use a procedure called aphoresis, 
rather than aspiration. Aspiration is the giant needle that goes in your hip and then we suck out the bone marrow. Uh, apheresis is you get injected with a synthetic protein called filgrastum, I think it is. And then we take like a regular blood donation and then we separate out the baby bone marrow from the rest. The rest goes back into you and we keep the bone marrow. So uh, at issue before that court was whether or not that's too close to like just basically paying somebody for blood for it to be illegal, for one to be illegal but the other one to be legal. And the court did find in favor of the Institute for Justice and, and, and the plaintiffs in that, in that particular court case. And so now it is legal in the U.S. to compensate people for bone marrow. A former student of mine, Doug, um, started a company called Hemios, which unfortunately this year – uh, went under, so it uh, it went under. It couldn't it couldn't put up the fight because it takes a lot of resources, but it's available and it's a legal option right now in the United States. It's only a matter of time before some company comes along and begins to compensate people for bone marrow. And so now the question of like market design is top of mind for a lot of these companies. So in the broader picture, you mentioned sort of Peter that. No, the the first in a twenty seven part series about market. This first one is what, whatever, you know. But what is this? The, getting into the commodification area because I've always thought that that objections to money were a huge part of objections to capitalism. And if I and if someone said you know that the only reason I'm a doctor is because I want to go to the strip club every night and make it rain, they would kind of think that that was bad. Um, but if it's like the only reason I'm a doctor is to uh, buy fine art. They're like, oh, that's okay, but money allows you to do either one of those things, so it seems kind of crappy. So, so you learned all these objections, looked at the meaning of money. What have you did you learn about markets broader for like the general libertarian thesis? Even if this is not a libertarian book, like what we can, how we can communicate, or what we can like focus on better when we're just talking about how markets can make lives better. Yeah, I think. Uh the main thing is like if you're making purely economic arguments, um, what's going to happen is the, you'll win because the economic arguments are right. But the other side will always shift it over to moral arguments where they're going to say, yeah, that works, but it's bad. And you really do have to be able to make those moral arguments. So this book, I think, you know, my, my former book, Why Not Capitalism and others, they're there to meet them on their own terms. And uh, you have to play their game and you have to play it play it better. Um, but the, what the thing, biggest thing we learned, I think, about markets is just how, uh, how, how often the meaning of money and the meaning of markets can change and how much variation there is. And in a sense, the other people on the other side, their, their complaints are extremely parochial. It's like they've seen very little of what markets can be and how money can work. And so their complaints are based upon that at most and often misunderstanding even the small, tiny sphere of the world that they're seeing. Uh, I also, just to add, I think it would be wise for uh, libertarians to focus a bit more on business ethics. And here's, here's what I mean by that, right? Like here's, here's a question. Should prostitution be allowed? The answer, I think, is yes, and libertarians are going to say yes. But there is a separate question about how you go about buying and selling sex. And it is true that there are better and worse ways from a moral point of view to offer sex for sale, right? Um, once you realize that, like when I say that a company shouldn't be selling sex or shouldn't be selling tickets or whatever in that particular way, when I make a kind of moral objection to that particular bit of behavior, I'm not suggesting that it should be illegal, right? I'm not saying, oh, oh the government should come in and like regulate it and make it be in accordance with my own conception of the right way to buy and sell sex. That's not, that's not the point. But being neutral or like leaving it up to the market to decide how people buy and sell all of these like sensitive things, I, think, I, I don't think there's any reason for us to be silent about those particular issues. I think we should be vocal about like, no, this is the wrong way of selling this thing. It should be sold in this way rather this other way. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because like, if you think about the history of libertarian thinkers, none of, none of the major important libertarian thinkers have believed the following, that all morality is, is about rights. That's reduced simply to the question of rights, right? Nevertheless, it's very common among, say, libertarian lay people to sort of talk about as if all that is, there, that's all there is to morality, and it's not. Yeah. I mean, the resistance to like, is it a moral obligation for me to pull the child out of the puddle? I think if anything is obviously a moral obligation, it's that one. It's hard to resist the obviousness of it. I think too many people kind of look at that case and if it's an obligation, then they think that my view is that the government should enforce baby saving. But of course, that doesn't follow. That's a non sequitur. 
right? So the fact that it's an obligation that you pull the baby out out of the, uh, you know, keep the baby from drowning, doesn't mean that you need to institute Good Samaritan laws. So you don't have to deny the strong intuition that probably most people, except for like maybe sociopaths or psychopaths, feel that like yes. Obviously, I have an obligation here. You don't have to deny it to avoid the conclusion that the government should institute it. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.